Hello, everyone. Yet once again, it's another day of fresh grace and mercy. This is the Guilt, Grace, Gratitude podcast, where we bridge the gap to Reformed Christian theology for your listening pleasure. Today is a book club episode with Esau McCauley on. He's going to be talking about his new book. And just so you guys know, he he was the author of the best-selling uh, book, Reading Wild Black. And the book we're going to be talking about today is How Far to the Promised Land, One Black Family's Story of Hope and Survival in the American South, published by Penguin Subdivision Convergent, just so you guys know. And there's a link to our show notes taking you right to this book so you can order it for yourself. Really easy. Click and order. And then more about our guest today and uh, other just normal show note reminders as every episode and just uh, we're on YouTube. You can find us on Twitter and Instagram, you, how are, how you can email us, uh, how you can find us for other uh, engagement and communication. Um, so we are excited to talk to our guest today, Esau McCauley. I'll let Peter further introduce our guest today. Yeah, we have Dr. Esau McCauley, he's Associate Professor of New Testament at Wheaton College and Theologian Residence at Progressive Baptist Church, a historically black congregation in Chicago, author, like Nick just said in the book that I read that really got me interested in Dr. McCauley's work, the Reading While Black and the children's book, I think also with IVP, hmm. uh, Josie, Josie Johnson's Hair and the Holy Spirit, contributing opinion writer for New York Times. I've read a lot of his stuff on New York Times, so I'd encourage you guys to read it too. Writings have appeared in the Atlantic. Washington Post and Christian Today. So it's a pleasure having you on our show, Dr. McCauley. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Of course. Yes. Yeah. So you you uh you grew up a football player in Alabama. Are you yes. a Bama fan? Listen, <laughs> <laughs> I I am I'm the worst kind of you're gonna get me canceled by the whole state of Alabama. <laughs> Um, you're neither. You're I, not an Alabama fan, or you're. I'm, I'm lukewarm, of, uh, so I root for whoever is good for my state. <laughs> so since Alabama Auburn. is always good, then I'm usually rooting for Alabama. Okay. So if both of them are good at the same time, and they're playing in the game and they're both undefeated, I would root for Auburn. Oh. But if Alabama is good, I don't want Auburn to ruin the season just so Auburn can have a moment of glory. So I like Auburn, but I'm kind of like I support my home state. <laughs> Okay. I got gotcha. you. Gotcha. Okay. So you're, you'll, you'll, we'll, we'll call you, a, we'll call you a, a fair weather Bama fan. Well, here's the thing. This is actually true. I used to work at this place called Hibbit Sporting Goods. And every, every year they'd have like the, the for the big Alabama Arbor game, it'd be sep- like half of the um, sporting goods plays would have Alabama stuff. The other half would have Auburn stuff. Okay. And people would come in and they would go roll tire a war eagle and if you didn't pick the right one you couldn't work for them to get your commission and so i began to look at what clothes they had on and this roll with whatever uni they came in and so i sold my soul uh. <laughs> or shoe sales as it relates to alabama <laughs> like back in the 90s so i've never been able to been like you know, I, I didn't have the integrity to say i'm an auburn fan and if you don't want me to sell you your cliques you can go on about your business so I've been back and forth ever since. Hey, when you uh, got to make money, you got to make money. You got to do whatever you, know, you got to do. I'm 16. I needed some clothes. I need some kicks. Yeah. So that's what I was doing. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. So uh, kind of first question about yourself. So just beyond your kind of academic and ministry bio, tell us a little bit more. And I know we'll get into it, obviously, with this book, but a little bit more about Esau beyond your bio. Um. Well, I think part of it is, and this is in my bio, but I'm a husband and a father and a Christian. Those are the three things that I think begin to define who I am. Mm -hmm. And I have a wonderful wife and four children ranging from 15 down to seven. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of boring, actually. I'm a bit of a homebody. I like to read (laughs) um, when I'm not, and, and to just write when I'm not doing my university work. And so, yeah, it's not, there's not a lot of interesting stuff going on. I'm, I'm kind of lame. Okay. I, I like lame people. I'm kind of lame yeah. myself too. I, I have real dad energy. My um my my I was I was at home last weekend and my brother asked me, have you seen I could think it's like the new Escalade there's a new suburban, some kind of new <laughs> suburban that came. I was like, buddy, I was looking at the new minivan. So I'm sort of like, <laughs> uh, yeah. you're more you you're my this? style. Yeah. You, need, you see these new features on the Sienna. That's what yeah, I was man. looking at. Yeah. So you got so that, like, you I, got that. <laughs> That minivan energy right now. Yeah, I yeah. was like, man, I need a new minivan. Like I said, like this, I, I'm I'm done ever getting anything that is like cutting edge. So I'm like <laughs> real. I was like, I, I remember 
I cut the grass a few weeks ago and felt great about it. And then I had like a moment of panic. This, this, like, this is way too satisfying. <laughs> yeah. That's like right. a freshly yeah. mowed lawn is way too satisfying. That's like and me I, getting socks for Christmas. It's yeah. Like, like, like oh, I hate getting socks I, as a kid. Now socks. it's like, it's like, heck yeah, give me more socks. Yeah, give us, give us, give us some decent socks. You know, now, now that I'm a father, that Sienna is looking really good. Doesn't it? Doesn't <laughs> it? <I'm laughs> like, like, whoa, yeah. this is not, we, we want, like, if, if I maybe, <laughs> Maybe I should work harder to sell books instead of talking about minivans. <laughs> but I want a hybrid minivan. If you want to know what I That's... really want in 2024, the Lord blesses me. I want a hybrid minivan so I can tr- drag my kids all across the country and feel like I'm not destroying the, the environment while I do it. There I you like go. It. What would 16-year-old Esau think of this Esau? <laughs> <laughs> he would counsel him. <laughs> we didn't have we didn't have counsel at the time. He'd be like. <laughs> You, you know how they had, you know, there's that meme, I forget what it was, where the guy comes up and he has the skateboard in his hand and oh, he yeah. had yep. on backwards like, Backward hat, hey, yeah. hello, fellow teens. That's a, that's probably the energy that I would get if I tried to, uh, if I tried to connect with young people. I spoke at my kid, my son's um, Christian school chapel uh, okay. a few months ago. And he's like, dad, just don't try to be cool. Just like, <laughs> he's like... <laughs> And so his own his only his only concern was whether or not I like if he could if I could get through the chapel service and not embarrass him, then I succeeded. There you go. <laughs> All dads out there are like, amen. Yeah. This is this is speaking my language. Yeah. yeah so we've you've already talked, or I've already kind of broached this. <clears throat> you've already talked about this. So how far to the promised land is is essentially an autobiography kind of a sorts, yeah. but it's not really common practice for someone who's as young as you to write an autobiography. Yeah. So it's it's a little more than that. So you can describe like what what are you writing in this book? It's background. Well, it's not, why did you decide to write it? Well, it's not it's not an autobiography. It's um, it does tell a lot of my life story, but yeah. it actually skip it skips significant parts of it. Even I'm forty three. But to be honest, the the idea for the book really began back in twenty seventeen. My father was a truck driver, mm-hmm. and. He died in California, uh, mm-hmm. far from everyone that he knew. We, we're from Alabama, as you've already heard. And during most of my life, even when he was near us, he he had, he abandoned our family at a young age. And when he abandoned our family, that kind of sent us tumbling down the economic ladder. And when he was um, with our family, he was often um, addicted to drugs and, and he was violent yeah. towards me and my siblings. And so for most of my life, I didn't know him. And so when he dies in 2017, my family comes together and they quickly decide, we want you to do the eulogy. Yeah. And you are a pastor and you you, you know this part. <laughs> yeah. Like when you do when you do a eulogy, if you're going to do an honest one, there's a couple of things you need to do. Mm-hmm. You need to know about the person who actually passed away. Yep. So you have to sit down with all of the members of the family, tell us about this person, the good and the bad. Yep. But if you're a clergy person and you're not just doing sentimental stuff, mm-hmm. you have to wrap that person's life you have to make sense of that person's life in the context of the wider purposes of God. What was yep. God doing in and through this person's life, the good and the bad, to build something about who God was and what he was up to? And so that process, because it was my father, it wasn't something that was separated from me, right? And so learning about his life and his past had a tremendous impact on me and, and my own life. And for example, I found out that one of the last things that my father's father told him before he died, my great my grandfather, who I never met, he told him, you know, you're you're no good and you're only going to call pain to the people around you. And those last words left a traumatic impact on him. Hmm. And so what happened in the context of, of researching the his life for the eulogy, I kind of found myself digging deep into our family history. And our family history that, that spans, you know, at least the part that I researched that spans three or four generations from like the 1900s all the way up until my my childhood mm-hmm. really takes place at these key points in American history. So mm-hmm. I've, I have, cho- I have um, my great grandmother is, is born and she lives during Jim Crow. My grandfather and my mother lived during segregation and desegregation. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I was born in, in the 90s, 80s and the 90s. And so it really isn't just my story. Mm-hmm. It's the story of my family and the struggle to make sense of Black life in America. And, uh, and then a lot of those stories the things that I began to see is the prominent role that God plays in all of our lives, both yep. in acceptance and in rejection. Yep. And so it really isn't about autobiography of me. That would be something I would never do. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. But I think that there was something, I think there's a lot of things in 
my family's life and history mm. reveal something about um, the Black experience in America and the search for God in the midst of that complicated um, that complicated period of time in American yeah. history. That's helpful. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Thank you for that background. And uh, my first question be just asking for you to provide just a really brief explanation, a 10,000 foot view of the themes of your book. And the best way to probably do that from what I was looking at would be looking at the three parts of your book that were named um, Absence and Presence, The Vine and the Fig Tree, and Ordinary Glory just to kind of give you those as categories to give like a really brief, just summary of each of those. So people can understand, wrap their brain around what this book is laid out. So I'm really grateful for Penguin Random House. They had a lot of, a lot of confidence and maybe they're crazy, but (laughs) they, they allowed me to structure a book around a eulogy. (laughs) Yeah. And so the opening part of the book, my father passes away. Mm. And I agree to write the eulogy. And then the entire middle section of the book or the rest of the book deals with the stories and the things to relate to his life and mine um, that that were kind of uncovered in the process of that research. And then the final chapter itself was the eulogy, the mm-hmm. final the final mm-hmm. section that's father to son to visit it. You get to see the actual eulogy delivered and then the book kind of closes. But the, the three sections of the book. Um, absence and presence speaks about the two things that shaped my childhood. Mm-hmm. On the one hand, it was shaped by my father's absence. Mm-hmm. And it's it's really hard because in some sense, the star of the book is someone who's not there for most of it. But mm-hmm. anyone who's had a parent or a family member or someone who you love who abandoned you, that whole creates its own kind of energy. And so I deal with the fact that my father, for example, um, he gets convicted of a variety of kind of small and petty crimes throughout my childhood, and then he gets sent away to prison. And so he's gone, and that absence has a tremendous impact on me. But who was there uh, central to the story was my mother. Yeah. And my mother was this, um, is this godly woman oh, yeah. who, who took us to church every Sunday, who loved the Lord, who, who inculcated in us a sense of self and identity. And she was the one who provided many important lessons that shaped how I understood the world. There's this chapter, for example, called Single Mothers Aren't Allowed to Die. Yeah. And it deals with the fact that my mom was the economic and and um, emotional center of our family. She got a job working at Chrysler, um, and that's that allowed us to kind of move into a slightly less poor neighborhood. And then she gets a brain tumor, and yeah. then that that had we end up on disability, and that ends up causing us to have further economic trauma. And so you have both the absence and the presence, my mom's ab- presence and my father's absence to shape who I am as a child. And one of the things that, that I got from that section of the book, one of the things that, that, that I think the trauma shapes us, it simplifies our dreams. Hmm. You know, one of the things that that I really wanted, and this is kind of funny, it's like, it's hard to talk about this because it's like free puberty, free even hmm. understanding. Like <laughs> girls are gross when we're having this idea in my mind. <laughs> yeah. But I said, you know, I wonder, I wonder what it would be like to have a, a, a wife have a husband who loved her. Yeah. Who was always kind, who was always honest, who was always gentle and and, 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 and non-threatening and not abusive. And I said, you know, I wonder how that would affect how she perceives herself. Cause I saw how that how my father's um behavior impacted my mom. Mm-hmm. And I said, you know, I wonder what it would be like. If if a son, I was I was a boy, I couldn't I couldn't imagine what my sister was going through at the time. Yeah. I wonder what it would be like if a son had a dad who loved him. Like almost like a science experiment. Like if you started at the beginning and you went through their lives. And so one of the interesting things about my life, and forgive me if I don't answer your questions quickly enough, but one of the interesting things about my life is that I never had any vocational dreams. Yeah. So I never like some kids say, I want to be a lawyer. I want to be a doctor. I want to be a football player in the NFL. Mm-hmm. I, as a kid had like, I want to be a husband and a father. Yeah. More foundational and stuff. Foundational stuff. And so I've always struggled with trying to figure out what to do with my career. Cause I didn't really care. So it's kind of weird that people say like, Oh, you're a writer. I never had any idea. So Ashton and Preston deals with that one. The vine and the fig tree, the second section of the book deals. And that's from, it's the passage in the Bible. Mm-hmm 
where <laughs> um, they all sat under their own vine and fig tree and there was no one to make them afraid. That's the picture in the Bible of the peace that God would give to his people when they finally made it to the promised land. And that, that section deals with different people in my family that almost arrived at that place, but they don't quite get there. One of the things that, that I think that we often do when it comes to memoirs and these national stories is that we tend to focus on the people who we perceive as successful. So the only people whose lives actually matter are the people who begin in poverty and make it to the middle class. You can kind of sell podcasts and books and self-help things. Here's how you become rich. And this is the these are the lives that matter. And one of the things that I, I didn't feel comfortable about that is because that, that just didn't feel true, especially, especially as a Christian that the only lives that matter are the ones that are materially successful. Yeah. And what I said, you know what? People's struggles, people's struggles, there's something important about what they go through that are just important as the ones people we perceive as successful. So the, the idea of the vine and the fig tree explores the, these attempts in, our, in my family around different characters to, to, um, to make it to like the promise that you need to get there. Now, the last section is ordinary glory. It's kind of what I think we're all looking for. And it's once again, challenging the notions of success. Mm -hmm. You know, I used to think, by the time I get to the end of the book, I talk about, you know, I should think I had to be this perfect father that that was always wise, that was always, you know, um, patient and never made any mistakes. And I was the perfect husband. I do all these things correctly. But the older that you get, you begin to realize that I'm a flawed human being. That even if I love God and say my prayers every day and fast, it doesn't matter. I'm still going to, my humanity, my brokenness is going to manifest itself. And so I can't be perfect, but I can be good. And what I realized, I didn't need a perfect dad. I needed an ordinary dad hmm. who would just do the things you needed parents to do. And ordinary, I think, is achievable for all of us. And one of the things that I, I say to my students, so I just want to talk about wheat in college. Mm -hmm. I say, you know, most of y'all are going to die. Well, all of y'all are going to die, but most of <laughs> y'all are going to be forgotten. Like, you're going to die, and uh, the only people who are going to know about you are the people who are immediately around you. Even the famous people here at Wheaton College, they're so famous that we put your name on the on a building. Half of the time, you just think of it as the lunch hall, right? It's called Fisher. You don't know who Fisher is. Mm -hmm. and I said, so even if you're famous, if there's a statue. You just walk past the statue if you see someone. And I said, so even if you're famous enough to get a statue, you'll be forgotten. So what actually matters then? If it's not fame and this lasting memory, which is unachievable for all of us, what can we do? We can live honorable lives before God. And if you live honorable lives before God, then that's a success. Because God sees that life and says that life, regardless of its material outcome, glorify me in some way. Mm -hmm. And so ordinary glory is my way of articulating what I think we ought to be hoping for as, as, as people and the followers of Jesus. That's wonderful. That, yeah, that's beautiful. I think what's powerful is that your story is so relatable. Yeah. I mean, um, I. Whether I or not you went through the same circumstances, it's still incredibly relatable. Yeah. yeah. Can I say something about that? One of the things yes. that was really interesting, and I'm glad that you mentioned that. So I think, I mean, at least, at least I don't think that either one of you, neither one of you are British, right? <laughs> no. Only by. Okay. At least okay. Not directly. Yeah. Okay. Not, yeah. not, okay. So you, you don't, you don't know the life of an English Don, right? <laughs> But no. nonetheless, we've all read Surprised by Joy. Yeah, mm. true. And, yeah. And, and we found like his spiritual wondering yeah. <clears throat> compelling. Mm -hmm. And I think there's something, I think that we we tend to have this mistake that things are universal if we kind of remove the particularity of them. Like, in other words, in order for something to be more universal, we have to remove the things that make us unique in order to relate to more people. Yeah. But what I've actually found as a writer it is something that is authentically articulated and well envisioned. People can relate to it because it's human. 100%. And so How Far to the Promised Land is set in the Black South, in Huntsville, in Northwest Huntsville, Alabama. And it deals like Jim Crow and mm -hmm. cotton fields. But you don't have to actually have that direct experience because it's speaking about these universal themes that all people experience. And one of the things that's mm -hmm. often missed is, and this happens to me all of the time as an African-American writer, a, 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 white, a white person will say, well, can I read this even if I'm not black? I said, well, I read C.S. Lewis. <laughs> yeah. I read Flannery O'Connor. Like, I don't know what it's like to, like to have, I mean, not, I'm not being flippant about her disease. Sure. I don't know what it's like to have, you know, a, a debil debilitating disease as a Southern woman during the time in which she lived. 
but there's something about her voice mm -hmm. that speaks to me. And so what I really wanted to say is there can be a, a book that is set in a distinctively African-American context that can, for that reason, be universal. And sorry, this is, I'm going yeah. to do my Bible stuff for a second. Yeah, but do it. Please. Absolutely. Anyone who's read the Old Testament, like one of the reasons that people read the Bible so poorly is that we tend to think that the Bible is written like to us directly without the mediating reality of a culture. Yep. So in other words, in order to understand and apply the Bible well, you first have to understand what it meant to the original audience. Mm -hmm. And then God is confident enough to assume that we can do the work of translation. Mm -hmm. But God says, I can have a particular people, Israel, in a particular time, in a particular place, particular norms, and speak directly to them, while at the same time saying something that's universal. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that like, as a writer, I'm writing the Bible. I'm saying that this phenomenon mm -hmm. is the same for any good writing. It is mm -hmm. particular because the particular it is universal. That's the reason why people know this, right? Like, I'm not a British fiction person, <laughs> but people who like British fiction realize there's a certain inadequacy. I mean, not inadequacy, idiosyncrasy. Idi yeah. It's idiosyncratic. Mm -hmm. The way that British dialogue works and how it functions different than the great American, the American writing style and even Southern American writing. And so we understand regional truths, but for whatever reason, sometimes we're a little bit hesitant to deal with that as it relates to African-Americans. Yeah, absolutely. I agree hundred percent. Yeah. And on a personal brief note too, just a relatability uh, based on my biological father experience when I was a small child, I could, even as a small child, I could not wait to be the father that I didn't get. Yes. I remember thinking about that and being like, yeah. I can't wait to be a husband that I didn't see and a father that I didn't personally get. And I'm going to change my family tree. Yes. I remember <laughs> thinking that as a young boy. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, it's weird because it's like you don't even understand how families work. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't really want to marry a girl when you're like six years old. But you're just thinking, I want to be a kind husband. Mm hmm. And I think, I think one of the hard things for me is it's, it's, it's been really hard for me to think in terms of career. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people interview me all of the time around like, oh, why did you go into the New Testament? Did you always want to be a New Testament scholar? I was like, no, I always want to be a dad. <laughs> I like the Bible. Yeah, like, yeah. You know, but I always want to be a dad. Or, did yeah. you always want to be a writer? I was like, no, I didn't know that I was going to be a writer. And so it's almost like I am now trying to understand how what God is calling to me, calling me to do beyond my family for the rest of the world. Amen. That's so good. Um, going back to the book, uh, the beginning part of your book, very, very beginning part of your book, you tell a story um, when you were on a panel at UNC in 2019, taking questions from the student body audience there was a particular question that was asked that you and the yeah. panel declined to answer at the time. But in the book, you say this is what the book is about. Can you take us yeah. back to that question that was asked and why yeah. you felt you needed later to bring it out in this book? So in 2019, I'm sitting on a panel with one of my um, heroes. I guess I can say that someone who I've respected a long time, a uh, hip, Christian hip, art, hip hop artist, Lecrae. Yep. We're talking about race and justice in Christianity, whether Christianity is a friend or foe to racial justice. And I want to say, yes, the Bible, rightly understood, speaks to the equality of all people in the image of God. Yep. Yep. And against um, the mistreatment of um, uh, at, at risk communities. Absolutely. So um, they asked me this question. And the purpose of the question, as best I understood it, is to kind of inspire some empathy. Tell us about the worst, the most racist thing you've ever experienced. And I, the answer is the reason, and I, I decline, I say, no, I'm not going to answer that question. I just kind of pass. And the reason is it's really hard to understand the, the entirety of the African-American kind of experience in the United States, even for one person, not everybody. And so when you say, Hey, here's the trauma. Well, then I, that's kind of one slice of what we experience. And and that trauma can maybe mis be misinterpreted and used in ways that I may not agree with. And so I want to say there's more to the African-American experience in America than a series of racial racially traumatizing events. Mm -hmm. And so and the one of the things that is problematic about that is when you tell that story, I'm the hero. Like mm -hmm. the racist does something bad. The audience knows what to do. They can boo the racist. 
And then I overcome the racism and I'm a better person for it. And you you begin to admire me as the protagonist fighting against racism. But this, but racism is more complicated than individual acts of animus. And it happens more than just in a moment. The, the, the reality of racism lingers through the centuries. And so rather than telling one individual story, in order to understand racism in America, you need to understand the story of the people. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, I, I'll give you one, one example of this. Yeah. My grandfather on my mother's side was um, started picking cotton at the age of four. He was born in 1937, so it's like 1940s. He's picking cotton at the age of four. And his family, out of the cotton that they pick, they're tenant farmers, they had to pay for all of the um, like the feed and the equipment to, to farm the land. And then at the end of the year, they were kind of, they found out whether or not they broke even. And long story short is every year they would say, you just broke even. And they couldn't negotiate because it was 1940s Jim Crow. You couldn't say anything to the guy who owned the land. And so my grandfather missed school all of the time because his family was forced to pick cotton. Now that same that same that that family had like a young boy who didn't have to leave school to pick cotton, who benefited from my father's my grandfather's labor. And so he wasn't held back in school. He was able to be enriched by the economic exploitation of my my grandfather. Mm -hmm. Now one of the things that they know every study tells you this. The biggest predictor of future college education is the education of your parents. Yeah. Well, then what does it mean that my grandfather was legally discriminated against through the entirety of his childhood? And then he had children, my mother. My mother then had a structural disadvantage rooted in historic racism in the United States. My mother then, got, sorry, I, 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 I want to say this. No, my mother, going, yeah. my mother, and this is the, my mother starts school. And th I think they integrate in like first or second grade. But we had this imagination in our head that this like integrated the schools and he had equality and justice. Yeah, immediately. But to, be on <laughs> but to be honest, first of all, there was a long period from 1954, my mom goes into schools in like the late 60s when they're resisting integration. So the, the integration doesn't actually happen until she gets to first or second grade. But then the teacher don't want to teach her. She's the black kid in the classroom. And she said to the discrimination all the way through um, high school and middle school. And so then this long trail of racism impacted my grandfather, directly, legally impacted my grandmother, grandfather, impacted my mom. I'm the first generation of people in my family to go to integrated schools from beginning to end. But once again, my mother, because of Jim Crow and segregation, didn't get a chance to go to college. So now I'm, I'm, I'm trying to overcome institutionalized injustice yeah. that has impacted my community. And that's the kind of, so it's not just like, did a random police officer pull you over unjustly yeah. in this one moment? It's like, how do these things linger through time? And how do those things create patterns that are harder to untangle? Yeah, not easy to answer for a single yeah. panelist question. <laughs> because, because what people happen, and, and this is the reason why I think we really struggle as a country. Yeah. Mm. We, we want to litigate the history of racism in America at every single incident. Hmm. So in other words, we say, okay, if something happens in this particular interaction and we say, was it or was it not racist? And we feel like if someone says, yes, it was racist. And then we say, oh, that means we have to recognize the racism exists in the world. And they say, no, it's not racist. And if you feel like you can disprove that event, then you've disproved racism and everything is okay. But what I wanted to show people is that none of these events are individually are separated from one another they're part of a larger narrative one of the reasons why i like the bible sorry to give a bible analogy again no keep is going that, this, is, this is a bible podcast bible podcast so i can i can go full bible on you one of the <laughs> yeah. things i love about the new testament is that people like to argue about this verse or that verse and they're important but the truth of christianity is never in one place right no it's like the bible says the same thing over and over again it's not like oh i gotta find grace Mm -hmm. Only in Romans. No, no, mm -hmm. grace is in Galatians and Ephesians everywhere. The same truth reoccurs such that something like the doctrines of the Trinity, the doctrines of grace, don't ride on the exegesis of one passage. Yeah. They're like for me, and I and then listen, maybe this is gonna be bad because like this is a reform <laughs> podcast and y'all love Paul. And I love it. I'm a Paul scholar too. <laughs> but I just don't, I don't, I don't, I don't in my own New Testament scholarship, I don't do a lot on a doctrine justification. Sure. And, and let me explain to you why. I just read, and this, this is maybe bad, but it's true. I just read <laughs> the Bible. That's 
That's what you should do. And, yeah. and, 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 and this is the part that I want to say. I can't read that text without coming across with an overwhelming sense of gratitude. Yeah. And the idea that this God is gracious to save me apart from what I do. And that's just good enough for me. Like, that's just like, for me, like at that point, I'm like, I'm happy. Now I know yeah. people who like want to get the doctors, but they want to get narrow and narrow and clearer and clearer and clearer. And God bless you. My doctoral advisor, N.T. Wright, he loves to fight about that stuff. <laughs> I'm just like, when it comes time for me, I'm going to plead the blood. Like Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. I just need you say, grace. That's all, like, that's all I like, 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 I'm happy. Right. Yeah, as yeah. long as you say to me, I'm graciously saved. Cause I just can't, I can't read the new Testament and not see that. Totally. I can't. In the same way, then, what I'm saying to you, if you take a step back and we stop litigating every single incident, because some incidents that may appear racial may not be racial in the end. But if we look back at the long scope of American history, we have to acknowledge the long trail of the of the of the real disadvantages that have accrued to African-Americans over the century due to racism. So I don't got to fight about individual stories. And the reason why I told a family history it's because I think that truth emerges across time. And so I'm going to say one more thing about the yeah. family history mm -hmm. is the other problem when you tell racist stories is that it eliminates the, the, the agency in black people. Hmm. Because yes, I believe there are like structures in society that put people at disadvantages, but I also believe that human beings are actors who mm -hmm. make decisions mm -hmm. and those decisions have consequences. Mm -hmm. So I think that too often in society, we have either mm -hmm. it's all society or it's all the individual. Mm -hmm. But in my own life, in my own actual lived experience, there was both racism and injustice, but people in my own community who did things that damaged me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a true accounting of my life deals with struggling to overcome or understand both of those things. And in order to understand both of those things, you have to tell a story. Mm -hmm. Because once again, if you if, if you just stay at a thousand feet and say it's all society or it's all individual responsibility, that doesn't get to the complexity of the human experience, in my opinion. Mm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So digging into this, maybe a specific episode. Um, so you you were a football player growing up, and generally speaking, you're like I kind of saw this as my way out. This is like how I got to university. Yeah. It's how I paid for it. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit. But your experience is kind of experience overall in this community. Yeah. Where when you played football and then you got hurt, you yeah. I think you hurt your knee. I forget forget what you hurt yeah. exactly. You tore something, and then you had to focus on the academy and you're like I'm I'm not yeah. I'm not I'm not this. Yeah. Um, and so how, and not saying it wasn't the expectation of everybody, but generally speaking, like yeah, you like you got as an athlete, not as an academician, but you kind of got into this because you were injured. But you talk yeah. a little bit about so like how how often, you got into uh, this. Oftentimes, you can only dream of what you can see. Yeah. And I know people just think that that's a very simple thing to understand. But one of so my children, my mm -hmm. children, all four of them, my my youngest is seven. She's already talking about what she's going to do when she gets to college. My mm -hmm. son is who's who's nine and goes like, I want to go to Wheaton College because his dad <laughs> is a professor. That's what he sees. And, and so he sees, he said, oh, I can be a professor. My 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 wife is a pediatrician. They, oh, I might be a doctor, I might be a professor. Maybe I'll do this. You know. And so they're surrounded by professional like the professional class with their friends and their in the, in the and so they can imagine a path to school where they just do well now obviously i knew in my neighborhood that you can do well and go to college sure. the question is what could you see I, my sister was the first one on our side of the family to graduate from college she's two years older than me mm -hmm. and so the people who i could see in my neighborhood who went to college many of them did so through sports and athletics and so for me to imagine going to college through sports was no different than someone who grew up around doctors who dreamed of being a doctor one day. It's what you could see and imagine. Mm -hmm. Now, when I got injured, so I'm, I'm the first game in the playoff my, my junior year. At this point, I'm already being recruited yeah. by yeah. Some, some major colleges and universities. And so I, I'm already thinking like, oh, I, I pretty much have mm -hmm. um, That's your way this. out. My way, I remember, I, I talked about this in the book. So when, if, if you've never been, a, maybe most people who have, they weren't like really good college athletes. I mean, high school athletes. So you started getting phone calls from coaches and they would they would mail you letters and I kept all the letters in the box. Yeah, that's what I got as a high schooler yeah. myself. Yeah. And so yeah, and I, and I, and I, and I, was, I would go, I would go home and I just open up that box and I would read them over and over again. Mm -hmm. People don't remember this. This would be like outside of 
this, I don't know the demographics, but in my high school, I remember one week, it was, I think it was Gene Stallings. This is like pre, uh-huh. this is pre, um, uh, what's the guy's name who's there now? Uh, Saban. This is pre Saban. This yep. is like, yep. this is when Gene Stallings was there and Philip Fulmer was the coach at the University of Tennessee. I remember being in high school and seeing these head coaches walking around in our school. And I was like, oh, like I can go literally and touch uh, this guy. Yep. We had a, we had a, we had a high school player from our team who had gone and his name, Joey Kent, who had been a star at the University of Tennessee. So I could see it. Now, when that was taken away from me, I had to imagine a different way. And that different way that I began to imagine was academics. It wasn't that I was bad in school beforehand. It just wasn't my hope. And one of the things that I think that people don't understand about college, high school athletes is that happens in a lot of ways. That happened to me too. Sports, sports, I call sports a gateway drug into education. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you, you 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 do your work in school so that you can play the sport and you find yourself falling in love oh like wow i can actually graduate I actually can use my brain and so what happens is my injury kind of speeds that process up and it, it, it and it allows me to begin to a, a imagine a different path through to college than the mm-hmm. one that i had planned before yeah so it wasn't necessarily that you had thought either academics or sports before though it may not have been that binary but because all you had seen was sports in your community, all they saw was sports, that was like, that's the way out. And then when that was taken away from you, then you're like, oh, I guess I can also do this too, because now yeah. I see this. Yeah. And my mom had always been, uh, she was the one who used sports to kind of keep yeah. me in line. Yeah. That's she right. was the one who said, if you don't, if you don't stay in those books, I'm not going to let you play football. Yeah. And so it was almost like, I would say the biggest difference for me and other people who who didn't necessarily um, make it to college through sports, you had a lot of hope in it. Yeah, it's the way that my mother undergirded that 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 idea that you that I was more than simply an athlete. Yep, and I think that sometimes it felt like both the child and the parent had sports as their hope, mm-hmm. and that makes sense, right? Because once again, the parent sees the same thing that mm-hmm. oh they could imagine their child as a star athlete. And so I think that there were, there was not just my mom, there was tons of, of black moms and black dads who said, you're not just an athlete. You're also, um, you also have a black mind. So that wasn't u- unique to me, but it was just my experience. Yeah. So second question, not terribly related to this, but you've already talked about this and this brings up a new topic as well. So your relationship with your father and then meeting your soon to be in-laws with your wife. And then like you wanted to have a father and now you kind of see this father figure with your wife and they reject you. Yeah. So those are two separate questions, my father and then this in-law. So I I would say um, one of the things in the book, and this is probably a little bit indulgent of on (laughs) me. So maybe the readers can, we'll, we'll, we'll have some patience. There's a love story in the middle of this book. Yep. Um, that kind of just breaks out. It's kind of like um it's a good love story. It, I like it. It was a story, it was a story that I want to tell. Yeah. And one of the major themes in the book is that we are more than the the mistakes that we make. Mm-hmm. And that no matter what mistakes we make, there's always a chance to, to begin again. Uh the 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 opening kind of, I guess you call it preamble mm-hmm. to uh to the to the book is the story of the um the sinner and the tax collector and the Pharisee. Yep. The tax collector who has lived a life of sinfulness nonetheless repents and says, God have mercy upon me, a sinner. So if you actually pay attention to that past, that's the theme of the book that you mm-hmm. see these people who have these moments of redemption. And so I don't want to give away what happens to with um in that in that chapter, but I would just say that there is a moment of failure. Mm-hmm. And then there is a moment of forgiveness. And I think that the only way to be a Christian to me is to live in a constant expectation of hope and being willing to be disappointed in the meantime. Because the point of the gospel is that none of our stories are over as long as we draw breath and that God has the power to snatch victory out of the jaws of defeat. And Although those victories in my life and the people around me weren't always complete, mm-hmm. that there are numerous moments where God does that. And that occurs in that chapter. So I'll leave a little bit of a mystery mm-hmm. for, for mm-hmm. our readers, but I think that that's at least with their tongue to kind of see what happens. The, the, the name of the chapter is Fools Fall in Love. Mm-hmm. And uh, 
I think I hope I hope that people like it. It was it was one yeah. of the last chapters that I wrote in the book, actually. Yeah, no, it's I'll I'll I'll, I'll, I'll uh, add to that. It I won't give it away myself, but it do it it brings some tears to your eyes. What happens? I I do. Mm-hmm. It's I appreciated the writing and I appreciated the story. It was it was a good look into this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's a great <clears throat> lead into my final question and getting some gospel hope going as we kind of get towards the back end of the conversation. Um, My question would be, is there an eternal goal regarding God's kingdom answering the question about quote promised land and hope, you know, and related to that prior to Christ returning. So we're in the in-between phase, the in-between his first coming and second coming. What is the hope in this present age? Yeah. So it's funny because one of the things that happens when you write a book is you lose control of the narrative. The narrative writes itself in some ways. Mm. And when I thought of the title, um, you know, obviously the title comes before the book, at least for me. Mm. I I I had planned to end the book saying something like, um, there is no promised land here. We're looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. Yeah. Mm. It basically like our promised land is like it's eschatological i think yeah. the book does not actually end it does not no <laughs> but it does not but like i still believe that to be true but totally. I like yep. the book the book went to a different place um and so part of me wants to say that i my, my honest belief about the promised land both in the old testament and what we experience here on earth is there a foretaste of something yep mm-hmm that what Israel experienced during those moments of peace in, in the promised land were a picture of the, the greater kingdom of God that's going to come in its fullness one day. So in between in between those two times, what I think of as the sources of my hope are rarely individual circumstances because the, the fates, especially of Black people in America, wax and wane. Yeah, You know, racism comes, it, it peaks and has peaks and valleys. It's, and so if I am looking at my external circumstances as the source of hope, then I think I'm going to be consistently disappointed. Yep. But my source of hope is that I believe that like there was a guy named Jesus who was crucified and three days later, he rose from the dead. And mm-hmm. the world is different even when I don't experience it as mm-hmm. such. Mm-hmm. One of the interesting things that you that that, that you you might you may or may not have noticed, there's only one word that is in the title of how far to the promised land and read it while black. And it's actually hope. Hmm. And it's because I think a significant portion of my life has been sent, spent trying to answer this question. Hmm. Given what I know about the experiences of black people in America and the brokenness and the sinfulness of humanity, what kind of hope do I have? Things are going to be different for me. Yeah. or for my family and the answer that i came to time and time again i believe there's a, a god who orders the affairs of humanity and who bring those things to the proper resolution in the fullness of time yeah so i want to want to end this conversation where you end this book and also where you start it and i don't know if you have a bible next to you or if you can pull it up on your computer but okay I have, okay I'd actually like you. I like. I'd like you to read Luke eighteen nine through thirteen, which you begin with, oh, and really what you yeah. end with. So yeah. first, if you can read the passage, and after you read, how does this relate yeah. to your father, and why do you end the book with a funeral? Okay. Mm. Good question. He told this parable to some who trusted in themselves; they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray: one a Pharisee, and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all of my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, while he would look up to heaven, was beating his breast and saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Yeah. So, man, this book is, on one hand, I can say it's a bunch of things. It's an extended <laughs> exegesis of this passage. Yep. Amen. Because we tend to think like the Pharisee. Oh, yeah. <laughs> in this parable, not Pharisees, you generally speaking, the Pharisee yeah. in this parable. Yep. We tend to look down upon people who we regard as sinful. Mm-hmm. And we think that their lives aren't valuable. They reveal us, they reveal nothing about God, yep. but that we, the holy and the righteous, are the star of God's <laughs> yeah. story in the world. Yep. Yep. Well, the tax collector actually is the star of the story. Mm-hmm. The person who was sinful, 
who God nonetheless worked. I mean, God worked his, his, his he did his work on him and he redeemed him. Now, on one hand, the star of my the star of this story is the is the long search of redemption for my father. Yep. Not me. Mm -hmm. Now, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. This is the part that I think is important for people to get. We hear the tax collector story. And we say, praise God. God saved that tax collector at the end. He he kind of pulled him out of the fire in the brand put from the burning or whatever. But that tax collector throughout the entirety of his life created all types of drama. Think of all of the people who the tax collector mistreated before mm -hmm. he converted. Mm -hmm. The people who he's robbed, the people whose families he ruined by taking their resources and enriching himself. So yes, we're happy that he converted, but there's the trauma that is left in his wake. So the story of the book is the story created by the trauma of the sinfulness of people. Mm -hmm. But we're happy nonetheless that they get redeemed at the end. And so how do you wrestle with those things? Because I was a victim in a sense of the my father's own wandering. And how do you not excuse that or push that to the side, but make peace with it? And so what I was trying to get at is we can both celebrate someone's redemption without minimizing the trauma that their brokenness causes us. And part of what I wanted to be able to do is to say, I wanted to, I wanted to have a different kind of story for my children. That of course, even though me and my father aren't the same, I'm not an addict, I'm not gonna abandon them. Mm -hmm. But I wanted, I wanted, I was not perfect, but I wanted to be able to say, my children can have a better future because they didn't have to deal with my brokenness all of the time. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the eulogy is the account of me making peace with that reality. Mm -hmm. So it opens up with this idea, and then it closes with um, kind of the end of that story. The last scene, the, there's two kind of bookend scenes. The, the book opens with my uh, going on a trip with my, with my son. Mm -hmm. And the book closes with a conversation with my son. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're actually, actually, chronologically, even though a lot of it happens in between, they're roughly around the same time. Mm -hmm. And my my son said, because he he heard he hears the eulogy. He says, you know, it was sad at the beginning, but mm -hmm. the ending was good. Mm -hmm. And and I and this actually this but this this is not by the way artistic. This actually happened. I know everyone's like I had the conversation with my son. In case you're wondering. <laughs> yeah. Like we talked about this. And yeah, I it's said, not artistic license. It's not, it's, it's not artistic license. This is an actual conversation. And I remember saying to him, yes, son, that's how it was for me too. Hmm. That, that that you have to lament the brokenness of the world before you can rejoice in um, the ways which God can snatch victory out of defeat. So in some ways, hmm. it is a, a long meditation on making peace with the brokenness and redemption of my father. You know, I, I do want to say in light of the gospel, I hear forgiveness in your story. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I wish I, so one of the things that's really that's really frustrating as a writer, and I get it. <laughs> people want easily digestible ideas. Yeah. This is a book about five ways to be successful. This is a book about this or that or the other. But the human experience is so complex. Right. Mm -hmm. So on one level, this is a spiritual odyssey of, in which I make peace with the, like, the role that God plays in my narrative. Mm -hmm. On another hand, it's a long med meditation on forgiveness for the people who harmed us. Mm -hmm. On another, from another angle, it's a story of a broken man who was struggling towards something he couldn't quite attain. On another hand, it's a story of like a bunch of people who had the same kinds of brokenness who are attempting to find something meaningful. But I guess what I, I guess what I want to say is that I think that there are certain stories that stick to us. They kind of like get inside of us and they won't let us go until we write an ending to them. And these stories, the things that I recounted in the book, changed me and shaped me into who I am. And I'm foolish enough to believe that these stories might have an impact on the reader as well. That, that the same things that, that, that tremendously impacted me might be able to impact them and make them into better people. Hmm. That's awesome. Well, Dr. McCauley, thank you so much for your work, for your writing, for uh, the transparency in the book, for I'm assuming how hard parts were to write and, and recall and remember, but also the forgiveness and, and the redemption that's also found in this. And like you said, I think, people regardless of what background ethnicity that they come from they're gonna they're gonna find something to to connect with in this book so thank you so much for your writing and thanks for coming on the show thank you for having me i really enjoyed it of course